following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. This is uh, another lecture of Gnostic Anthropology. Anthropology. You know this word comes from the Greek language, anthropos, human being, and uh, logos, which is a word or study of everything related to the human being, that is anthropology. It's Gnostic, it's another word, it's a, from Gnosticos, Greek word, which means knowledge. So the whole word, Gnostic anthropology, is a Greek uh, root, which is the study of the human being, from the Gnostic point of view, or from the knowledge. But Gnosticism is really a, a science uh, or knowledge, a doctrine very profound. We find knowledge or Gnosis in different religions. That's why in Ukraine, in the next lecture, we were talking about to know or knowledge. Of course, the type of knowledge that we develop, or we want to develop, is the knowledge related with the being. Is the knowledge related with the being? Right? One thing is the knowledge that we acquire in universities, in different places of the world, in many ways. In another is the knowledge that we acquire together with the being. The being is called in uh, Gnosticism the tree of life. And uh, the knowledge itself of the being is called the tree of knowledge. Again, we have to remind you that uh, the Bible, in the book of Genesis, talks about these two trees. The tree of life and the tree of good and evil, which is the tree of knowledge. Which were in the middle of the garden of Eden. Of course, in Gnosticism, we learn that these two trees are related with two symbols that are very profound. The tree of life is the being. In philosophy we said that the being is the being. And the reason of the being to be is to be with the same being of the being itself. The being is God. The spirit, the real self. 
And when you study the real self, the being, you have to study it in the tree of life, which in Kabbalah is called the ten sephir, which are ten parts of the being. Kabbalah is also a word that is very common in this day and age to the people that study this type of studies, they hear Kabbalah. This is coming from the Hebrew language, Kabel. Kabel means to receive. So when you are studying Kabbalah, you are receiving. But as we explained in the previous lecture, there are two types of Kabbalists. Or there are two types or ways of receiving knowledge. The way that we are doing right now, in which I am teaching to you, and you are learning, you are writing, but the way, that way is called intellectual knowledge intellectual way of receiving doctrine. But the way that is related with the being is the intuitive Kabbalah. Intuitive is coming from intuition. You know what intuition is? This is in relation to the heart. In the heart, we have that, uh, uh, or those, uh, how do you call, uh, events or actions, that when you say that I have a hunch, right, you say hunch, this is related to the heart. Something that tells you about things that the intellect cannot understand, not, cannot comprehend, that is intuition. But in reality, what is intuition? Intuition is the way in which we hear, or we sense, is the word. We sense the guidance of the being. You see, it's here in the heart when you receive that guidance. It's here in the heart when you receive the knowledge. But for that, of course, we have to learn to put the mind united with the heart. To make our mind an intuitive mind. And that, of course, is a matter of uh, practice. Because in this day and age, what we have and what we, we are accustomed to, to use is the intellectual mind. And we use rationalize. Everything that you receive, everything that you need, you rationalize it. You use your, your intellect. But the intuitive mind is different. It's a way in which your mind learns from your spirit. An intuitive mind is a mind which is under the service of the spirit, or for the spirit, for your being in the world. But when you said, what is the being? The being is not the ego. Because we say in many lectures, that ego that we have, that we call my anger, my lust, my pride, my envy, my gluttony, my laziness, my self-importance, my self-esteem, my self conceit etc., etc., my fear, my doubts, all of that is not the being. The being is something that we have to experience. We have, we say, 97% of uh, ego, which is this false self inside of us, which is related with the 
four bodies of sin. The four bodies of sin, or it's also called the inferior quaternary. The ego is related with the physical body, with the vital body, with the emotional body, and with the mental body. So this is what we call the inferior quaternary, means four. Physical body, vital body, emotional body, mental body. So all of that is what is the ego. But the being is beyond the mind. In order to experience the being, you have to go beyond your mind, your intellect. The being is an eternal now. The being does not think. You see, it's coming to my mind that phrase of Descartes, the philosopher. He says, I think, therefore I am wrong. I think, therefore, I am not. That's the reality. If I stop thinking, therefore I am. Descartes. Hmm? Descartes. 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 That's his, his last name? Descartes. Mm -hmm. or Descartes. Descartes. Well, in French, Descartes. Yeah. So that's what it says. I think, therefore I am. And everybody uh, in, in Ireland, it says, I think, therefore, I sense my ego. I sense my mind, my emotions, etc. But this is not what I am. When I stop thinking and I control the inferior quaternary, then I am. Because the real being, the self, the word says the spirit, does not think. The one that thinks is the mind because does not know. But the being, which is God inside, he knows. His philosophy is Yes, 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 now, now, now. Comprehension of what is life now, without reasoning. Comprehension, understanding is better than to rational reasoning. But in order for, for you to, to grasp that, you have to practice it. That's why we advise in the beginning to vocalize a mantra or to chant a mantra. Mantra is a Sanskrit word for uh, a word for prayer that will help you to put in activity your intuitive sense, intuition. That mantra is a Tibetan mantra that all the monks in Tibet vocalize every day. Is a mantra Om Ma Si Pad Me Yom. I don't know if you hear that before. Om Ma Si Pad Me Yom. So you vocalize that concentrated in, in your heart. You imagine a wheel golden wheel spin here and you vocalize oh spin right ma si Like the needles of the clock, you see? I am seeing the clock, so that's why I'm doing this. It's important that you know Yeah. 
See the clock in the speed, in that direction is speed there. Oh. Um, you see, I wrap the mantra as it is, as, as you vocalize it. Because you find that mantra in other words, and, and sometimes it's, the spelling is in the other way. But this is the way in which you vocalize it. This is, sometimes it's right, Om Mani Padme Yom. <coughs> but the way to vocalize it is Om Ma Si Padme Yom. Stand the sound of every vowel, of every consonant. And that, the meaning of that mantra in Sanskrit means, Oh, my inner God within me. God, God inside of me. Of course, that's put in activity here, you imagine that, and then the sense of intuition starts to develop. And then you start to be uh, to receive. You start to receive, you see. Receiving knowledge <clears throat> from your inner being. In relation, of course, with the work that you have to do, psychological work. And then you enter in the real, in the field of what we call the intuitive Kabbalah. The way in which you receive knowledge. And then you experience, of course, uh, that mantra increases your comprehension, your understanding. It is related, directly related with your consciousness, with your psyche. Because reasoning is really, or the intellect is, uh, what somebody says, the intellect is a, it's an instrument that shows us that through reasoning we cannot understand anything. That's the intellect. You have the property of understanding or comprehending that we cannot comprehend anything. Yeah. Because we are always in the strings. We say, this is black. And we say, this is black because it's not white. Right. It's tall because it's not sharp. If I'm saying that she's fat, it's because she is not thin. If I'm saying it's dark, it's because there is no light. It's all with the streams, you know. So the mind, the intellect never take us to the comprehension of that, it's only to the streams. Comparing, comparing. Mm -hmm. So that's precisely the problem that this humanity has in this day and age. Humanity has developed has developed the intellect too much. To the degree that they cannot entreat the things which are there, which are very simple. You know? And I say that, for instance, in the book of Genesis. How many centuries does this humanity have the Bible in, in their hands? How many sects do you find in the world? Not talking about, of course, the religions, right? Because there are many religions, right? But just about Christianity. How many sects of Christianity do you find in this day and age? A lot, right? And all of them contradict each other. The Jehovah Witnesses, when they come, they, they stone the Catholic Church, they stone the Mormons, they stone everybody. The Mormons also the same thing. And everybody is always saying, we have the truth. And when he says, what do you mean you have the truth? Where is the truth? And then they the Bible, here. And then you talk with the Jehovah Witnesses, they are here. And everybody is putting the Bible like, this is, this is, this is, uh, using the Bible as a horse, right? In the tournament, uh, to see which one you want to win. So then the logic tells us, if everybody is using the Bible, and everybody is claiming they have the truth, and the Bible is the truth, and everybody is interpreting the Bible in their own way, the logic tells me that they don't understand what the Bible talks about. Because if there is only one way, and then everybody will be only, I mean, figure for that. 
there will be only one religion, only one sect, not many, only one. Because everybody understands what it is. But because they do not understand, they are many. Everybody interprets in accordance to their own being. And that's the intellect. But when you develop intuition, you start seeing things, and then you have the hunch, oh, there's something here that means something. Right? Because the writers of the books of the Bible, all of them, without exception, they were Kabbalists. They were receiving that, but intuitive Kabbalah. To begin with, Moses. Remember, most of us we wrote five books. The five books that we find in the Bible: Genesis, <coughs> and then we find Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and Numbers. This is what we find: the five books written by Moses, most of the Kabbalists, and then the rest. Jesus was a Kabbalist. He had two great uh, teachers. He was uh, in Israel before going to Egypt. And of course, all of the disciples of Jesus who were Jewish, they were Kabbalists. So this is precisely the, the mystic doctrine of Judaism is Kabbalah. So they knew Kabbalah. So they wrote the Gospels in accordance with Kabbalah. You hear, for instance, I don't know if you read the book of Revelation. This book was written by John the Divine, who was a Jewish too. Kabbalist. So the whole Bible is Kabbalah, written by the Jewish, by Hebrew Kabbalists. So, but they were receiving that, as we know, the heart. But first we have to, to learn that uh, Kabbalah intellectually. But we have to combine that. You know, practical exercises and learn to develop that and learn to understand that and to comprehend more. Not just in the intellect. Because in this day and age you find many groups that talk about this type of things. So third thing, like Kabbalah, like alchemy, and many other things. But they just put that in their memory. They don't experience what they learn. So that is what we call an intellectual Kabbalist. There are many intellectual Kabbalists there. Many books written by them too. And they are experts in numbers. But here, what we need is to develop that superior emotional center. Here we arrive to that point, you see? Intuition is related with superior emotional center. And in order for you to develop that intuitive Kabbalah, a way of knowledge, you have to develop your superior emotional center. Never can you learn the intuitive Kabbalah with your inferior emotional center. What are, for instance, the inferior emotional center related with? Fear is related with that. Let's say, for instance, stress, anxiety, anger, hatred, hunger, or gluttony, in other words. Here, you see, all the things that you, hear, that you feel here, pride, self-importance, self-esteem, that is inferior emotion. Superior emotion is related with the being. Superior is what is above. Inferior is what is below. Right? So when you say superior emotion, you're talking about the being. An emotion 
but is related with it, with the being. And for that, of course, you have to uh, experience, to exercise the momentum, always here and now, remembering the self, remembering God inside of you, not outside. Remember, in other lectures I said, to remember God is not to remember the God written in, in, in some book, or the Bible, or the Quran, or the Bhagavad Gita, or the writings of Buddha, no, that God I wasn't talking about. The God that I'm talking about is the God that is inside of you, in, in, in your conscience. You have to be in touch with it. It's inside of you, not outside. When you start doing that, you, you are always in a superior emotional state. At any time, at any moment, in the beginning it's difficult, so you have to start doing it. And that's to learn. That's why you see, when we start learning the tree of life, we see that, let's say, the ten sephira, ten circles, which are distributed in that way. Behind the, se- the tree of life, you find always an imaginary human being. How do you call that in Hebrew language? It's called Adam Kadmon, which means the heavenly man. The heavenly man. Adam Kadmon. Adam Kadmon. This heavenly man has ten parts. And Adam Kadmon has the ten sephiroth, or the ten parts of himself, fully developed. Let us start here, for instance, you find three triangles. One, two, three. The three triangles. Every triangle mm-hmm. is related. If we imagine our physical body with the three brains, so we have to imagine that because these ten parts of the being are inside of us and potency but not in activity. Because if they were in activity, you won't need to explain, you won't need to to receive any explanation about it. But because you ignore about it, it's because they are not in activity. But we have them. This first triangle that you see here, above, is called the three supernals, or the three primary forces, which in Christianity, everybody knows, receives the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. These are not people, the forces. Call it the three primary forces of the universe. The three primary forces are also uh, named holy affirmation, holy negation, and holy conciliation. Positive, negative, and neutral. In this humanity, for instance, the man represents the positive. The woman represents the negative. And the sun becomes the representation of the neutral. You see the family. In order for the family to exist, you need the three primary forces. Just seen from afar, you see. The woman and the mother, the father and the son. For the child and the world. That's three. 
So in order for a child to exist, we need the two primary, the two forces. So that's why they say that the three forces create. And this is precisely what we find on the cross of Christianity. The man represents the vertical uh, line of the cross. The woman represents the horizontal line of the cross. And that's why the third, which unites that two beings, is precisely what you find there, the crucified one, Christ, which you call the Son. The Son. But the three. So these three primary forces exist everywhere. For instance, in our physical organism, we have three nervous systems. Do you know these three nervous systems that we have in our organism? The first nervous system, or the main one, is called the cerebrum spinal nervous system. It's the brain, the head, and the spinal column. In that area, the cerebral and spinal nervous system, you find an energy that circulates there, that is a positive energy, which is called the energy of the Father, of the active energy. For instance, right now, I am using that energy in order to teach you. I am active, you see. I am teaching you, I am telling you, that's affirmation. That was this holy affirmation of active energy. Teach you. I give you. Mm -hmm. But you are there passive. You are not active. You are passive. You are acting then with your grand sympathetic nervous system. You know what is the grand sympathetic nervous system? It's a, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a component of nerves, nerves that you find here, around the heart, in this area, hmm? which is called the solar plex. The grand sympathetic nervous system is called the emotional brain. And that's why when you feel some emotion, you, or anxiety, you find it here. You, find, you never find it in your brain, here in your head. In this area, where you find that you're going to receive something, a surprise, and you feel like, uh, like a nut here and you're like waiting for that. Emotional brain is used by actors. You have to, you have to, use, you have to be in touch with your emotion. So then, when you are listening right now, that's why in this area we have, we have that chakra which is called the telepathic chakra, which means the way in which you receive is how you receive it here, thoughts, the antenna, the receptor of thoughts are here. Well, the thoughts are sending here, and my words here, you are receiving this area. So you are listening to the words in your ears, or through your ears. But you are <coughs> acting emotionally. When you start a state of mood, everything that you, you listen, you rationalize that, but you are there passive. That is called active, passive, positive, negative. But this is positive, negative, and neutral force, which is called also conciliation. We have to reconcile the positive with the negative in order to be, in order to, for a creation to exist. Here this is how you have to understand how, how this third uh, force acts. In order for you to understand what I'm saying, in order for you to comprehend you have to ask sometimes. If there is comprehension, if what I'm saying 
is useful for you, if you are understanding what I'm saying, and then there is a communion here, right? I am the active force, you are the passive force, and because what you are listening is useful for you, it's good, and there is a communion, right? That is, of course, what we call the third force, conciliation. Because when there is no conciliation, it's working. I mean, I'm teaching here, and you listen, and at the same time, they're all, it was good, but I really didn't like it. It, didn't, it was no conciliation there. No. It was no creation. So therefore, in order for a creation to exist, you need sometimes, and see sometimes after the, the lecture with questions, you ask, in order, in order for you to reconcile what I'm saying, in order for you to comprehend that, you see? Comprehension. That's why this third force in Hebrew is called Bina. And Bina means understanding. And sometimes you say, I do not understand this. I do not comprehend this. There's a lack of Bina. There is no conciliation there. But what you are doing, any type, any thing, any any activity that you do, you need to reconcile, not to comprehend, not to understand. You get that? You comprehend that? Is that the third nervous system? Conciliation? The conciliation works in the third nervous system, which is the parasympathetic nervous system. It's also called vagus. And is related with the sexual force. What we call the motor instinctual sexual brain in this area. That is the conciliate, the, the force of conciliation. The force that conciles the story and unites the two forces. That's why, you see, that's why you see the men. Is the active force. The woman is the passive. The woman has to receive the man in the sexual act. So the man is active. But what is the force that is going to reconcile them to the sexual act? Because through the sexual organs, they unite. So the sexual, the sexual force is the, the force of the so called the Holy Spirit. Right? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. These are the three energies that circulate in the physical body. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's why in the Catholic Church, we learn to do this, the cross, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We do the cross. Otherwise, they, although sometimes they do here, but the real cross when he's standing is here. Because if you do it here, your cross is upside down. And you see all oh, many Catholics, they do this, and they put the cross upside down. But they do it mechanically. Because everybody does things mechanically, right? without knowing. And the cross is upside down. But if you do it here, Inversion with your three brains. First brain, second brain, and the third brain. Whatever, right? And then the cross is standing. Mm. That's the cross precisely that uh, the symbol of Christianity. The work with the three brains, in other words, the one that is, this is carry your cross, is to work with your three brains, the three energies. For everybody, of course, because they don't study Kabbalah, they learn to do the cross, to repeat things there, to repeat here, but they don't know the meaning of it. So in order for, for us to be a real Christian, we have to know the meaning of it. In this case, we are learning the uh, esoteric Christianity, which is related with Kabbalah. Because this is what is Gnosticism is. What is Gnostic anthropology is. Gnostic anthropology in synthesis is a union of two great uh, philosophies, Christianity and Buddhism. This is what it is. 
But the Christianity that I'm teaching here is not the Christianity that uh, uh, anybody is preaching in the outside world, which is just mechanical knowledge without knowing the meaning of it. And uh, Buddhism is in relation with also inside. Not other what you find outside. Sometimes uh, people that call themselves Buddhists and they don't know what Buddhism is. You see, for instance, Christianity emerged from Judaism. Because it was precisely when Jesus came, came in Judaism. And from Judaism sprout Christianity. So you find the origin. And then you find, for instance, Buddhism. Buddhism sprouted from Hinduism. Because Buddha, Gautama, Sakyamuni, which is uh, the founder of Buddhism, was born in India. Even though Buddhism is very large in, in many countries, uh, in, in, in India is very, very, very small. But in Japan, for instance, in China, Tibet, and many other countries, Buddhism is very large uh, religion. But starting in, in India. So, Buddhism comes from Hinduism. Mm -hmm. what we call uh, Brahmanism, or Hinduism. That's why Gnostic anthropology studies Hinduism in order to understand Buddhism. And it study also Christianity, but Judaism. Because if we don't study Judaism or Kabbalah, we don't understand Christianity. It's impossible. So that's why sometimes we talk about, and you see symbols here, this is Hinduism. Hinduism. This is Buddhism. Buddhism. Symbols that we know how to interpret, right? Or the doctrine is that is there. In relation, of course, with the inner development. What we have to do. That is uh, the, the actual Gnostic anthropology. So, going back into the tree of life. Do you find there the three brains? And every brain is related with every, uh, with one of the three first sephira of the tree of life. Sephira is a word that, is a Hebrew word that they say come from sapphire. And sometimes with sephir, book of wisdom. The thing is that these ten circles are ten emanations of the same being. The higher part is called Keter. Keter means crown. That's why it's above the head. You see? The crown. Keter. Which in uh, Christianity, you will see the name of the, the Father. In the Hinduism, this Keter, or the Father, received the name of Brahma. <coughs> Brahma. Brahma. Which is not, of course, a person, or many people think, idols. Because when you see there, there's people who say, oh, this is an idol. Right? But this is just a symbol that encloses a lot of things that you have to learn. Even people in India who have those things, they ignore about it. Because always in every religion, you find the exoteric part of it, and the esoteric part of it. You see? The exoteric part of it and the esoteric part of it. Exo means public. Eso means secret. 
exoteric public, esoteric secret. Only for those that work in themselves. You know, how, what is the name of this uh, image here? It's called Shiva. Shiva. Shiva in Christianity is the Holy Spirit. Is this third Sephira or the Holy Trinity? Keter, Chokma, Bina. These are the three Sephira that I'm talking here, three circles. Keter, Chokma, Bina. Keter means crown. Chokma means wisdom. It's in Hebrew. Kemina means understanding. Comprehension. That is Bina. But Keter, in India, they call it Brahma. Chokma is called Vishnu. So we don't have Vishnu here right now in this. Do you know Vishnu means the ones who penetrate? So that's why in Hinduism they said that Vishnu is everywhere. He's in the center of the atom, in the center of any galaxy, any sun, any star, he's everywhere. This is precisely what in Christianity we call the Son. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Trinity. What is the word Trinity? Means three unity. Three unity. Trinity. Three unity. Three in one. And in order to understand that, I have to go again uh, and with the man and the woman. When the man and the woman are in the sexual act, they are one. One being. With the power of creating. I told you, the three primary forces create. They have the power of creating, but they have to reunite in a given point in order to create. You know, the man can create. He has sperms. Every sperm is capable of creating a human being. You know that. But in order to create, with his active force, he needs a passive force, which is a woman. Because a woman has the eggs. Because that sperm has to be united with the egg. Otherwise, there can be creation. But how are they going to unite that egg in that Firm. They have to unite the sexual act, which is a conciliated form, conciliation. So in the sexual act, the sperm penetrates the ovum in this creation, thanks to the three primary forces, man, woman, sexual act. This is the energy is united. And then we have life. As below, so above. As above, so below. Everywhere you find that. What is water, for instance? Chemically speaking, H2O is the union of two atoms of hydrogen. In this case, the two is a female. And the oxygen is a masculine. United, you have water. And likewise, all the compound elements are the union of the of the three prime of the three primary forces in different ways in order to create in simple atom or in the very complex planets, suns, moons, etc. So when we learn about this, we call it in Kabbalah says the three supernos or the three primary forces. We have to learn 
to, to think in them as forces, as energies. Because in Christianity and Catholicism, when they teach about the Holy Trinity, they say, oh, there are three persons in one God. People start thinking and giving form to God, like a human being. God, what we call God, has no form. But it is the origin of form. You see? So God has no form. Because if we start giving form to God, then it will stop being God. But God has no form, but takes any form he wishes. Because he's everywhere. You understand that? I can ask you a brief question. <coughs> You're talking about creation a minute ago. What relation would you say does do angels have in, in do they come into play? Because I understand there's an angel of creation, I'm not sure if it's Gabriel, but does he does he come into play in any way? Would you say? But there are many angels. Yeah. Millions of angels. Billions of angels. But what is an angel? That's the question. Superior being. A superior being. Or better if I say, an angel is a perfect human being. Okay? A perfect human being. An angel is a being who has fully developed all the separate. An angel is Adam Kadmon in himself or herself. Gabriel, the angel Gabriel, is an Adam Kadmon. Whosoever develops himself as a human being in a hundred percent becomes an Adam Kadmon, becomes an angel. Or, if we want to talk in the Hindu way, we will say, whosoever develops himself perfectly becomes a diva, a god in the world. So we call angels in Christianity or in Judaism or Muslims call angels. In Hinduism, they don't call them angels, they call it gods. Buddhism also call them gods or Buddhas. You see? Different names for the same thing. That's why when people say, I don't believe in polytheism. They say, but do you believe in angels? Yeah, well, they are gods too. And this is something here that you have to learn from Judaism. Because you, all of us are here are Christians, right? All of us are Christians, right? We have the Bible. <laughs> When you read the Bible, you find this. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That is the first phrase that you find. You find the Hebrew. But I have a Hebrew Bible that says, Vereshit Vera Elohim. That is what I said mean. In the beginning, God created. In the beginning, God created the sheep that are for him. You see? Hebrew. And the tradition is in the beginning, God. But I don't want to go out with all the other words. I'm just going to take the word Elohim for you. In order for you to understand. This word is translated in all the languages as God. But it's wrong. In Hebrew, God is this. El. That is in Hebrew for God. El. But you find the word here, you see? In the beginning. But if you take these other words, Eloah, or as well it says, Elohi, let me say others. That means, Goddess. A female God, in other words, in Hebrew. But these two words, I am, 
is plural. The meaning is sometimes we say table, tables, we add the S. Right? But sometimes we say gladiola, one, gladiole, many. Right? So many ways to say all this plural. But in Hebrew, in order to say plural, you say em at the end. Or sometimes you put ot. This is for feminine and this is for masculine. Plural. So when you say Elohim, you are adding God, Goddess, and then this is Gods and Goddesses in the translation. Translation is Gods and Goddesses. You see? That is the real translation. So we say in the beginning, the gods and goddesses created the heaven and the earth. But because the translators were, of course, translating in accordance with a certain ideology, for the people of Christianity, they said, there's only one God. And they put God. In order for people to accept that. But when you enter into these studies, you understand the monistic polytheism. You see? Because, for instance, in Hinduism and Buddhism, they say they are polytheists. The, the explanation that they believe in many gods. Christianity, Judaism, and Muslim, or Islam, they believe in only one God. So they are, therefore they are monotheistic religions. While the Hinduism and Buddhism, they are polytheists. Many gods, right? But here, because we are entering into the very root, into the very marrow of this thing, we said monistic polytheism, which is the union of both. Is it? And in order not to find contradiction. What is monistic? Yeah. Come from one. Monas in, in, in Greek means one. Unity. So this monistic, this monas, this monad, as we said, monad in English, monad is inside of you. Your monad is your being. Or in other words, your unity, your self, your spirit. You have a spirit, you have a spirit. That is your monad, your own unity. You are a unity. I am one, you are 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 one. Every one here is one. But if we take an account, in, in an account all of us, then we say, well, we are ten or eleven, whatever. There are many. But each one of us is one. So the monad is inside. One said, the monad is inside, but we take all the monads, all the unities around, and we have the word poly. That's why the word politics means to deal with the masses, to deal with the many, right? Politics. But in this case, we are uh, applying the word poly to the many monasteries. Polytheism means the many monads or the many individualities. The angel is a monad. But if we talk at all the angels, then it says polytheism. Many gods, in other words, or many angels. So monistic polytheism is the comprehension of your own inner God in relation with all the other unities. And this is here we arrive where the great Kabbalist Jesus of Nazareth says, right? You have to love your own God with all your strength, with all your mind, with all the etc., etc., and the neighbor as yourself. And also the other neighbor. I mean, if I love my own God with all my strength, with all my force, I have to love also and respect your own being. You understand that, right? As I respect my own. That is precisely the, 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 
the entering the communion of the holy. But when we put in the sense, oh God, it's outside, this one, outside there, who knows where, in the cloud, maybe beyond the solar system, in the center of the galaxy, is what they hear, so God, maybe, who knows, maybe beyond the galaxy, they say. God is here, inside of you. Not outside. If that is the God that the Bible says you have to love with all your heart, and you have to only one to love only one, which is your own. No, outside, inside. And that Jesus says, love your own God and the neighbor, as you do with yourself, as free as yourself, then the neighbor. That is monistic polytheism. My neighbor would mean. Well, you are my neighbor. You have your own spirit. You have your own God. So I have to respect your being. So you said the angel Gabriel, right? This is one being. You have your own God. You have to work for your own God, for your own being, for your own self. <coughs> but it's Gabriel there that can help you. But Gabriel is another unity. It's another monad. So the name is your neighbor in other words. But in, 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 in the neighbor, there are many, many degrees. Neighbors that are above you, angels. The neighbors that are below you. But each one of those neighbors have his own particular monad, his own particular being. And you have, you have to see that. Right? Know his ego. And the ego is another thing. Because Gabriel, for instance, has no ego. But the rest of the neighbors which are below, they have ego. Because when we talk about these three primary forces, they are inside of each one of us, inside of everybody. Yeah. Um, how does that relate to this is a question I wanted to ask you another day because I think it's just something I didn't understand in terms of the bodies like the causal body, the astral body and all of those bodies how does that relate all fall in all of the other circles that present yeah. the here for instance let me say that the second triangle is called the triangle of the being, the triangle of the soul as well, of the psyche. And here we find the spirit. The divine soul or the spiritual soul and the human soul. This is the, this three. So when we talk about, for instance, the spirit, so the spirit is your own being, your own God. That's why here, this is the spirit. But the three primary forces above are everywhere. In your spirit, the three primary forces are inside. This is, for instance, this is your monad. This is your monad, the circle. And one, two, three. These are Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So inside of every monad, there is always Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Positive, negative, neutral. In all the bodies. That's why I'm telling you, I was telling you a, a few minutes ago. The cerebral spinal nervous system is the nerve for the primary force, the father. The grand sympathetic for the son. And the parasympathetic for the Holy Spirit in your physical body. So, but those three primary forces are also in your spirit. Potential forces, forces that create. Grasp that, right? That's why the spirit is called the child of God. This is called the spirit, the child of God. Because it is emanated from this first triangle. And then we have the spiritual soul and the human soul, which are commonly called the soulmates. 
But what people are looking for my soulmate, they said, but the soulmate is inside. The two, the couple, masculine and feminine, is inside. And this human soul is what is called the causal body. So we have to create, that's the question, right? the causal body. And then below it, we have another triangle, which is called the mind. That mind that is listening to me right now, this. And then the emotional body. And the vital body. It's called also the ethereal body. You see here? Yeah. You see all the other triangles. And below, the physical body. This is what we know. This is what we know. The physical body. So what we use right now. You're sitting there, this is this lecture. You are sitting there, seated with your physical body. But the physical body exists thanks to the vital body, the superior part of it. Because the physical body is only the inferior part of the physical body. So we are here in the very bottom of the tree of life. In other words, physically speaking, we are the inferior part of which is above. We have to go up in order to know ourselves. First, we have to start here. Because something simple like that, like this three primary forces that you have in your physical body, how long you have your physical body? How long ago? 32, 33, 21, who knows? Each one of us has different age, right? But you don't know your physical body. Even though people preoccupy themselves too much for the physical body, what to eat in order not to make it fat, what the exercise to do, etc., etc. But meanwhile, related with their psyche, they are zero. You know, you study in, 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 in college and in school that you have nervous system. But nobody told you that those are the three rays related with the three primary forces of the universe. There are many things that also are inside of our physical body that we ignore. Because we are just uh, identified with the things of life, the material things. We have to study here how the physical body is related with your spirit, your being, the tree of life. So does intuition lie in the spirit or the child? Intuition is related with the heart. Here's the heart. You see the heart? Oh, yeah. yeah. And I, I guess I missed that. It's related with this too. This is related with this too. So could you rename those three, that triangle? There's the spirit, the spiritual soul, and the, is it divine soul? The human, the spiritual soul, divine or spiritual soul. Okay. And then we have the human soul. Okay. Then we have then the mind, emotional body, vital body, physical body. This is how you see the ray of creation descends. You see how this ends? It's like here, right? Mm -hmm. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, individual spirit, divine or spiritual soul, human soul, then the mind, then the emotion, the vital body, then the physical. That's yeah, and, and go further, right? But uh, right now we just read there. This is precisely what you find. Kakeya Kukma Binat. There's all the names here that uh, uh, 
I will tell you how the lecture is in order for you to learn little by little. Because uh, many things to learn there. But this, what I'm talking here is a uh, written the three primary forces. In your head, for instance, you have three atoms related with the three primary forces. When I'm telling you atom, I'm using the word atom from the sense of the word, which means small, right? This is an atom is the smallest part of anything. So when I say that we have three atoms here in the head, we have the three primary forces, you have to understand that I'm not talking about a half here chemical atom, atoms, you know? well, atoms of like fossil or whatever, right? Of matter, right? Spiritual atom. Small particles of the spirit there related to the three primary forces. For instance, here, between the eyebrows, you have a magnetic center in which you find the atom of the father here. The atom of the father. That is directly related to two glands. Where are the two main glands, small glands that we have there in the middle of the brain? The pituitary gland and the pineal gland. The pituitary gland in that gland, we have an atom of the sun, the second form. And in the pineal gland, the atom of the Holy Spirit. <coughs> that direction. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And that's why <coughs> the one that works here in this area, you see here we have the chakra of clairvoyance, the chakra of wisdom. We learn how to use this, develop that, develop wisdom, knowledge. We have to learn how to put an activity for sporty. With that mantra, we put an activity also here and also this force is here. The three atoms. You have to vocalize that at least ten minutes daily. If you can do it one hour, that's the best. But concentrate it in what you see. Vocalize. Yeah. Over the last while, we've been given a lot of different mantras, and I try to mix them up as, as I'm pronouncing them, as I, as I meditate per day. Mm -hmm. And is there one in particular that we say that well, it stands out, but more important that we take rather than woo or... Well, the mantra, woo, is mantra when you meditate. Yeah. Yeah. But this is not for meditation. This is for, uh, what you said, chanting. You learn to, to put an activity in intuition. Mm -hmm. Because that's why you have to prolong. Mantra and woo helps you in order to meditate here. Yeah. But this is mantra you prolong in order to put, to recuperate the powers of your heart. Because that's the problem in this day and age. People lost the powers of the heart. And that's why they, they, they only understand intellectual things. So when you develop the powers of the heart, and you sit down, which is behind the world. As I said, for instance, in another lecture, simple things that are obvious. Like Jesus said, for instance, for their fruit you will know them. The logic says there is something there, right? Doesn't mean that in the moment when you want to know how the people is, they have to have in their hands papayas, you know, watermelons, bananas, you know. As you use your logic, it's not that. For the fruit means a tree give fruits. Right? So that's logical. Right? So there are many things there that is, they have the meaning, but you don't see it. Because the heart is not active. 
But in this case, for instance, which is very obvious, for the fruits you will not them, I immediately tell that that, that means something, right? But other things that are not pretty obvious because the the heart is not active, you say, oh, no, that is literally, as, as, as it is written. But for instance, I see when I read many things, not only the Bible, all the books, I see there's something hidden there. But when other people read it, they say, oh, no, I don't see anything. Because something there that is not developed, you know? You develop your heart, you start seeing things. As for the fruit, you will know them, which is very common, which is very obvious. So how do you decide when you're reading the Bible what's an analogy and what's literal? It's prayer, it's the power of the heart. It's only the power of the heart. Otherwise, if you don't have the power of the heart, you say, oh no, this doesn't mean anything. This is as it is written. This is what many people say. As it is written, no, there is a meaning. For instance, the Garden of Eden is a symbol, has a meaning. Adam and Eve has a meaning. The tree of life and the tree of good and evil is a meaning. Cain and Abel is a meaning. All of that. The Ark of Noah is a meaning of this. You know? But when you develop the heart, they say, oh, this is here, and you understand, you comprehend with the Kabbalah. But when you don't know that, you end doing what people are doing now, mm -hmm. going to Turkey, trying to find the Ark of Noah in the Ararat, Mount Ararat. That Ark never existed, physically speaking, never existed. As you cannot see people with fruits in their hands, because if by the fruit you will know them, because it's ridiculous, right? You know that is the meaning of it. The Ark of Noah is also a meaning, but because people cannot see that, they are looking for that Ark there in Turkey, you know? <laughs> and they are wasting their time, because that Ark never existed, I repeat, never existed physically. It's a symbol that you have to know, but they don't know that because they don't have the, the chakra of the heart. When you start developing the chakra of the heart, then you start seeing the need of it. Intuition. That is intuitive Kabbalah. But of course, first, it is it's necessary to learn all of this that we're learning here. The ten parts, main parts of the being, which is the tree of life. So when you read the book of Genesis, you find that in the middle of the garden of Eden was a tree of life. It's not a tree that you find here. You find apple tree, pomegranate tree. No, they were not like that tree. It's a symbol. I mean, the tree of life is a symbol of the being. And the tree of knowledge, another tree, symbol too. Okay, so therefore, you recommend, in order to uh, develop our intuition, we chant this scale. And that way, if we, if we want to really understand, interpret the Bible correctly, we must, we must chant and develop our intuition. So that as we're reading it, we know automatically what it's trying to tell us. Yeah, but don't expect to, to understand the Bible in, after one week of, of vocalization. Not even after one year. Yeah. Because to receive is to hear the voice of God, of your spirit, of your own being inside of you. You see? And then you know. But that takes time. Don't okay. think that you have to vocalize for instance half hour and then you take the Bible. You see what's going on here? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> it's not like that, you know? No, like that. So Let me tell you, if you do it seriously, if you study it, on top of that, any other thing, maybe after five years, you will start seeing things, understanding things. Or maybe less, who knows? It okay. depends on your level. In the meantime, how can you, what can you pick up from it if you can't decipher what it's trying to tell you? In the meantime, I will tell you, because this is why I'm here. You come here and I will explain to you what the meaning of it. And there's more. So I will tell you just certain things. And for you to learn the deep meaning of it. In accordance with Kabbalah. But you 
have to practice in order for you to learn too. Not only the Bible. So if you like only the Bible, what can you do? But you can read any other religion. You know, Buddhism, Hinduism. You can also read the many uh, other uh, different books of other religions. Quite. Then you find that everything is the same. When you read only with the intellect, you find contradictions. Like Darwin, Charles Darwin. He wanted to find the meaning of the origin of man, and he found the dream in the Bible, Genesis. He didn't understand Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel. Nothing to it. He says, yeah, this is just an invention of something. I will look for the origin of man by my own way. And then they create another theory. So now that everybody is listening, it's fine. It's just that the man comes from the The thing is that when you don't know this, you want to explain the origin of the man just here. You have to know all about and of course, you talk, you say the origin of man, departing from the point of view that we think that we are human beings. Right? But that's wrong too. We are not. We know that we are not human beings. We can be. We are in the way. We want to be human beings. So we're not going to be able to receive uh, maybe what we're looking for right away. But we should we should still continue. Of course, the comprehension will increase more and more. But for that, you have to develop your superior intuition, your superior emotion. In order to develop superior emotion, that mantra, it also helps to listen classical music. You see, and to put that, like when the bee is in the honey. You see a bee in the hive, when the bee is making honey, it's in there, right? It enjoys that. But this same, when you listen to classical music, you have to be like the bee in the honey. Inside, or like the fish in the water. You see, the fish swims in the water. So you have to swim in the music. And you know that, because when you listen to rock and roll, or that music that destroys your emotional center, you are just... Boom, boom, boom. And you are like inside there, unfortunately destroying your emotional center. But listen to classical music in the same way. Swim in it. You know, feel that with your superior because classical music is related with the superior emotional center. Like the music of Beethoven, for instance, in English. But you have to swim in it. You have to listen in it very carefully and swim in it. That's the way to, to, to like it. Because you only want just to listen there and not to swim in it. No, it doesn't work at all. That's how you said, swim in the music. Okay. That's precisely what thing that I observe. When young people just try to listen to classical music, when they listen to rap or all that, which is very destructive. They and they are in, in. They say, oh, I have to start this in order to develop my, my emotional center. They play it. Meanwhile, they're watching TV, or doing something there, just in, in the depth of it, to hear that. It's not. The hobby is that they don't like it. <laughs> they want just to. But all that classical music just, just like that. When I listen to classical music, I like to listen very, very hard. Because I like to, to swim in it. When you swim in it, you develop that. Right. But first you have to like it. Can you chant that at the same time as listening to classical music? Do you recommend that? No. Yeah. For instance, uh, lie down and play the Ninth Symphony of the Tommy and vocalize the mantra from the beginning until the end of, of the... Concentrate in your heart and let the music come into you like a big tsunami. You know it's a tsunami, right? Mm -hmm. You know it's a tsunami? You just see tsunami coming in you. Boom. And you are bathing yourself in the music and the sound and vocalize that. 
the ninth symphony of Beethoven and on my Why the ninth? Mm -hmm. I love the ninth, but why Because the chorale regularly right, right, with the sound of the, the verb, the word. It's the only symphony that is vocalized. Right? You do that. And then when, when they start singing in the fourth movement, that Oda, to joy, right? And then you say that, isn't that order? And at the same time, oh, my, so far away, you find your heart. So you do it, and you tell me what you expect. So I guess why you're reading also. Why? If you're listening to classical music and while you're reading, it's... If you want to listen to classical music, listen to classical music. You see? See, I listen to it. But when I'm doing something, no, you know? no. because I like, I like the sound of it. And well, it's okay. If I'm trying to, if write, you are doing that, I would say that it's bad. It's good. Like you process. listen, and you are working, or you are doing, you are cooking, or you are, you are showering, doing classical music in the, in, in the depth of your activity. It's still right. absorbing. It's good, but the way that I'm telling you is not that way. You have to listen. You have to listen to classical music. You listen. There is one symphony of the top and only one, but listen. Vocalize there at the same time, and that is the way. After that, if you want to listen when you are reading or when you are doing anything, any activity, do it. So you mean basically just concentrate on the music? Yeah. And then you will, when I talk here and I talk about the, this tree of life and many other aspects, because we are going to start talking about the Bible, one of the things that we are going to explain that, right? For you to comprehend that, and then say, oh, 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 right? But we have to do it uh, slowly, as Napoleon said. Okay. Do it slow because it's urgent. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah.